This will be a demo of the key features of using Zotero to collect and organize bibliographic citations. For the purpose of demonstrating Zotero today, I'm going to pretend that I've just started collecting sources for a small paper on food insecurity and college students. Up until now, I've just been pasting links to these sources into a Google Doc. But I decided that it's time to get more organized. And also, I want to easily create citations for my reference list when I'm done. So, I've already downloaded the Zotero app, and I've already installed the Zotero connector in my browser. We can see the connector icon in the top right. Now it's time to put the sources I've found so far into my Zotero app, and maybe even try to see if I can format them in APA style. After that, I'll probably get back to researching some more. Before I go collecting these sources into Zotero, I need to launch the desktop app so that it will be ready to receive whatever the connector sends to it. Here, we can see that Zotero is completely empty. In the spirit of staying organized, I'm going to create a collection just for this paper I'm working on. The collection will be represented by this folder icon. That way, when the folder is active or selected, the Zotero connector will know where I want the citation information to go. The library can have as many collections as you need. It's a lot like the playlists in our favorite music apps. In order to enable collaboration, Zotero also lets us create groups. Groups also appear in this left-hand pane, but they have to be created in the Zotero web account. We'll take a look at created groups at the very end of this demo. Now, I'll go back to my Google Doc and click on those links that I saved before so that I can go back to the sources and add them to Zotero one by one. When the browser lands on the first source, which is a website, my Zotero connector icon appears as a small piece of paper in the upper right corner. The connector icon will often change its look based on the format of the information sources. Right now, I'll click on it and add this website to my Zotero folder on food insecurity. A brief pop-up appears. This tells me that the connector is doing its job. Then I'll go on to the next link and click on that and so on. This one is a book, so it's going to take me into my library catalog. Now you can see the connector has changed into a book shape. I'll click on that. Again, I get my little pop-up. I'm going to go back to my notes. This one is an article in another database at the library. There's my connector icon, a little message from Zotero. I'm going to accept that. Add proxy. Thank you. That's fine. I'm going to click on my connector. And again, my pop-up tells me it's adding this to the Zotero desktop app. We can see that Zotero is set up in three sections called panes, like window panes. The pane on the left displays all the library subcollections and any groups that we create or join. The middle pane will display a list of every source in the active collection or subcollection. Librarians would call these bibliographic records. And we can see the three items I just added are already here. These records are the raw data that can be used to make up bibliographies and reference lists. And the pane on the right side will display all the details about the active or highlighted source in the middle pane. Now that we've added some information sources to our Zotero library, let's take another look at all the features in this Zotero desktop app. Above each pane are icons that are editing controls so that we can manually create and edit anything that's in our Zotero library. We can also add any items completely by hand. This is really handy when you're not online, but instead maybe you're finding sources in print, in a book, in readings for your class. In order to add an item manually, I click here. 
and I can choose what type of format it is. This will create a new workspace in the pane on the far right. That workspace is basically a data entry form with places to enter the author, the title, the date of publication, the journal name, and all the information that we might need to format a citation for a reference list. Now, another way to manually enter data is to paste in an identifier by clicking here. The most common kind of identifier is a DOI, a unique number given to digitally published scholarly sources. And we can see how quickly it finds and adds the bibliographic information. I've got a DOI right here in my notes page. Most recently created journal articles and scholarly publications will have identifiers like this. You'll have to copy and paste it. I suppose you could even type it in by hand. And it's going to go out on the internet and find that and grab it. And here it is. So now I have four items in my center pane. There are a couple more features that I'd like to demo here, and we can see both of them by using the Hannon Library OneSearch. So I need to go over to OneSearch right now. And in keeping with the theme of our work today, I'll look for articles or books on food insecurity and college students. And I may have to sign in. Yep. I'm going to follow that prompt and sign in. So whatever library catalog or resource you're using, you want to make sure you are completely signed in when you start work. The first thing to note is the little Zotero connector icon up in the top right has morphed again. And now it looks like a folder. That's because it's detecting a whole search results list, not just one item. And it's ready to add many items to our Zotero library. Fortunately, it won't add everything in our search results list. I mean, that's thousands of items. When we click on the folder icon like this, we get a dialog box so that we can select the items that we want to add right now. I'm going to go ahead and, and choose these three. Click OK. And again, my pop-up message shows that it's adding them to Zotero. And I can check and see that that's the case. And then I go back to OneSearch. Now, I'll return to the Zotero desktop app and continue to review its features. Zotero will grab the information from our library databases however it appears, but a key thing to keep in mind is that this information might not be quite ready to turn into a citation. And Zotero can't correct anything when it imports this information. So we have to check it and correct it ourselves so that it's ready to make correct citations, especially looking at titles and authors. It's a small investment in time that pays off well in the end. Now, one of the key formatting rules in citation styles is about sentence case and title case. So I'm going to actually demo quickly what we mean by title case and sentence case. And then I'll go back to my Zotero desktop app so that we can see how Zotero will deal with that. So all I need to do is highlight the title right click and choose between sentence case and title case. And I need to do that before I generate my bibliographies. We also need to keep an eye out for things that may still be written in all caps. There are still a lot of journals out there that put article titles in all caps and Zotero just pulls that right in and makes it part of the record. And we need to correct that before it becomes part of our bibliography or reference list. Now, unless the website creators used best practices for formatting, which many don't, Zotero might also put some website information into the wrong place or not captured it at all. And you can see 
When we're looking at a web page, the information captured is much skimpier than the information captured when we have a book or journal article. So we do have to keep an eye on those website records when we're in Zotero. Make sure it brought in everything we're going to need to create a complete citation. So all that means is we need to be familiar with our assigned citation style, APA, Chicago, or MLA, so that you can spot issues that you need to correct before formatting a bibliography or a cite while you write tool. Okay, now the real fun can begin because I'm going to show you how to create a standalone formatted bibliography or reference list from the items in our library. Again, that's the middle pane, and these are all the items we've collected during this demo. I'm calling it a standalone bibliography because using the Cite While You Write plugin, we can use Zotero to create our bibliography or reference list while we're writing. That's a whole different demo and a whole different video. Sometimes, though, we just want a bibliography on its own, perhaps as an appendix to whatever paper we're writing, or to use for an annotated bibliography because we don't even have to write a whole paper, or to paste at the end of our work if we choose not to use the Cite While You Write feature. So, to format a standalone bibliography, we need to select or highlight all the items here in the middle pane, which I've already done. This menu has a number of useful actions. So the pop-up menu here will now allow us to do all these different things to whatever we've highlighted. I could add these items to another subcollection. I could export them. But right now, I'm just going to select Create Bibliography from these items all the way down here. This leads to another dialog box where I can choose the citation style that I need. And please note that you can add many more citation styles to this list. All the primary ones are in here. So I'm going to stick with Chicago 17th edition author date. Then I've got these checked off. I want to output mode needs to be bibliography. And what I want to do is copy it to the clipboard because then I can stick it into a Word doc or a Google doc. I click OK. Just add this here at the end. There we go. Formatted bibliography in Chicago style. And of course, I still need to proofread it just to make sure Sotero got everything just right. And that's how that works. Now, one more thing that I want to demo, which is to show you how to create a group. To create a group, I actually need to log back into my Zotero web account. Once I'm logged in, I use the main menu tabs to get to the groups management. So here I am at Zotero groups, and I'm going to create a new group. Of course, I've got to think of a name for it, and that name has to be not taken by anyone else. So I'm going to try students and food security. And as long as that little URL below the input box is green, that means my, my name is mine to use. So we'll apply that name to the group. Then I need to make some decisions about whether or not the group will be open to the public or closed to the public or completely private. So based on what kind of project you have going, you may want to choose private membership. And now we have to click on Create Group. We may need to make some choices here. Only group admins may edit files, for example. And then Save Settings. Under Member Settings, importantly, this is where I actually invite new members by putting in their email address. So you can put in as many email addresses as you like and invite members. And you'll have a list of members and invitations, and you'll see when they're accepted. Now, having created the group, that group should now be visible in my Zotero desktop app, but I may need to refresh my syncing. So again, the desktop app syncs with your web account. 
And so any kind of changes that you want to make sure to see here will need to take effect after you have clicked on the sync button. So I did that and my new group is here. And when I start adding things to that, they will show up down here. So as we've seen, Zotero has a lot of features, can be incredibly helpful, but it also requires an investment of time to learn. LMU librarians can help along the way, so please visit the library Get Help page to reach out to us during any step in your Zotero journey.